I would like to hand over to someone who has been working in the banking, banking sector for a long time and realized that the information and educational tools around savings and how to earn money was mostly serving people like himself, people who are already very interested in finance or work with finance uh, daily. A situation he wanted to change. I say a warm welcome to Daniel Roos, CEO at Nuorda. Hi, thanks for that intro, Sophie. So first off, I'm very happy to be invited. I think this is a super important topic to discuss. Um, so let's get to it. So as Sophie said, my background as founder of Nuorda is a bit more in how you manage your savings and investments. And of course, you save in cash. So let's start there. Uh, everyone can see the slides, right? Awesome. So when we talk about cash, it has two main purposes. It's a medium of exchange. You can do payments with it. And it's a store of value. You can save in cash. Maybe not the best idea, but you can. On the payment space, like Per just covered, there's been a huge change. Like we're almost not using cash. There's no need for cash in Sweden. And there's a lot of innovative technology. Now, what's happening with the piggy bank, like your classic savings? Um, can that too go? cashless and what does it mean for to save cashless? I'm going to start with six very quick trends and technologies to set the stage and then kind of wrap them up in a picture of what we can, can expect going forwards and what's actually possible already today. First off, digitization, like we're not in physical cash. So cash has moved from the physical world largely to the digital one. That brings it closer to other assets. So suddenly you have crypto funds, stocks, and they're all in kind of the same digital universe. This highlights a difference that with the cash, you're not really getting any returns unless Pad decides to increase the rates dramatically. Um, otherwise, you can get your choice of returns and find something more suitable for your situation using other assets. So this is an enabler to like invest sleeping money, money which you have parked on a bank account, which you should be invested since maybe you're young and you have a long-term view. I'll put the e in there too, since that was kind of an interesting perspective, a bit for the future. Okay, second trend, uh, neobanks and super apps. Like in Asia, it's big with Alipay and WeChat, like one app that has everything in it. And we're seeing a lot of entrants in the fintech space where you have new banks that are mixing it up a bit. So you have cash and investing in the same app no account opening, no delays, it's super smooth. So personal example, here's an app I used for traveling, books it has like zero cost currency exchange. This is my cash account. And then one click away over here, I have crypto investing. When you use this app, it feels almost like just moving money between accounts, but you're actually putting them into some, you know, very interesting assets instead. So takeaway here is cash investments are getting closer in terms of like click distance for, for your regular retail users. Uh, then something that's super important is it's all getting cheaper, even free. So costs are going down. Like for 10 years, we've had funds which charge 0% management fee. Uh, free stock investing is big in the US. Like you would not expect to pay anything to invest in stocks. It's some availability in Sweden for like smaller amounts. You can invest in the stock market. There's no fees charged. And the big thing that's happening now is fund rebates. Like uh, when you invest in a fund, there's a fee charged. A large part of that is a kickback fee to the distributor of the fund, like your bank. And a lot of new actors are giving that to you. So you can invest and do it much cheaper. So this means you can invest short term. You don't have to keep the money invested as long for it to make sense. Another trend, which we're seeing again from the US, but what happens in the US generally comes over here. And this is probably new to a lot of people is fractional shares. So normally, if you want to invest in a company, I'm super excited about Apple or Tesla, you need to buy at least a whole share. So for Apple, you have to spend at least $153 to buy one share as of like yesterday. With fractional shares, you're able to buy a part of a share. So you can say, I want to buy Apple for 95. That's what I have left over today. I want to do like a mini savings in Apple. And then you own a small part of Apple instead. This makes stock, stock investing more cash-like. You can do it in like small fractions. Big in the US, there is some limited access in Sweden if you really look around. This lowers the threshold. It makes saving in stocks available to people that have very little assets. Okay, trend five is kind of an older one, but that's becoming important in this context, robo-advisors. The concept that you'll have a service, which 
asks you a number of questions to find out what your goals and risk tolerance are, and then it just invests for you. So basically, I can say, I don't need to know I invest. My app just does that for me. So this is kind of about removing the knowledge requirement, which is kind of a topic of Finlit here. Many actors came in. These are the early ones. Now there's hundreds. It's like everybody has a robo advisor. So it's super mature, but it's relevant when you talk about investing like your cash savings books. Somehow it has to be managed. Uh, last trend is kind of happening with Klarna and the whole buy now, pay later, also with credit cards. It's actually a way to unlock cash. So a lot of these services, you can you know, pay, some, pay for something now, but you actually have to pay 30 days later. This is in essence a free loan. So instead of taking your cash and paying for something, you're getting a free loan with very good rates. You can invest your cash while you're waiting to pay your credit card bill, or in some cases, a buy now, pay later bill. And this actually unlocks. It's like cash flow management that companies does, but for personal use. So you can unlock more cash and be more invested and actually stay in like zero cash. Uh, instead, use credit. So summarizing these trends, the kind of big picture is it's now easy to convert cash to other assets. It's one click away. It's very possible to invest in the short term. So you don't have to think in years. You can actually do investing for like 30 days. If you have some spare money left over, should be invested. Um, small daily savings can also be invested. There's a perception at least that anyone can invest because there's a robo-advisor for that. I mean, that's kind of thin line, but there are some thoughts there. And you can actually unlock more cash to invest. So short version is there's really no reason to keep cash savings, providing you're willing to take some risk in return for growth, especially if you're like a younger person, that makes sense. Formulating it in a totally different way, uh, there's the real reakmaka for the taking. Like if you're willing to dig in, find all the services, figure out how the market works. Uh, and this sounds like a cheesy sales pitch, but then you can have more than 100% of your money invested. You'll get cash back every time you spend money. You'll never pay exchange rates uh, when you're traveling. You buy your funds 50% cheaper than pretty much everybody else, et cetera. So there's a real difference between how the average person manages their cash and what's possible if you're like, interested and use, utilize everything that's out there. And there we get to the kind of discussion topic of Finlix. So why isn't everybody doing this? Well, of course, it requires two things. It requires time and knowledge. Like moving all of this, it's a lot of work. Like if you want to keep zero cash on your account and be fully invested, you basically have to do daily transfers. It's like horrible, of course. Knowledge, all the normal usual suspects, compound interest rates. Why is it worthwhile investing? different asset classes like you know bitcoin versus stocks versus a safe fund uh risk diversification like parasins in counterpart to risk uh where can you actually take big losses because the company just disappears and then the concept of optimizing your personal cash flows which sounds super boring but it's relevant then you look at the market like i'm sure there was some news to most people in here and we're the interested ones so there are so many services just understanding the advantages, disadvantages, and cost structures is quite a big job. And then there's a lot of behavioral psychology where you may be tempted to do things which aren't right for you. And you need to, as a consumer, understand this and what's good for you and what's not. I took this. It's a small picture of like Swedish fintechs. Not all of these are relevant for retail. But on the other hand, there's a lot of international ones that are relevant. So short picture I want to paint here is that there's a great opportunity for consumers to like make money, manage their money better, but the knowledge requirements and number of alternatives is like really overwhelming. So what's happening in the future then? Is this going to continue? Yes. Uh, we see definitely lower fees and faster transactions. And I like to think of it like we're going towards zero friction investing, like an asset cloud. You have all these things, cash, crypto, stocks, funds, and you can just move between them with one click instantly and no cost. That's kind of where this is heading. So it's if you want cash, keep cash, but otherwise you might as well just push it around to other parts. We will continue to see more FinTechs, but eventually there will be consolidation. Like you don't need that many providers as I had on the previous picture. Uh, for a while, things will be overwhelming, and then the kind of good choices will crystallize. This will, of course, mean there's going to be a focus on optimization and meta services. Just like the travel industry, there's a lot of sites to find the best flight instead of going to all the airlines. You're going to see the same thing here. So this whole push of like collect all your loans and lower the costs and move them, 
That's just the beginning. You're going to see that all over. So platforms are going to be more important. And this is going to be driven by growth of APIs and data access. We already saw regulation where PSD2 opened up your account data, having like a huge impact. Now there's a move to opening up investment data. And then if you imagine APIs where you could actually just move the money, so you could have a service that moves your cash around based on where it's optimal, uh, that would be a game changer. So you can see this case being real in a couple of years that I go into shop, I wanna buy a cup of coffee, I swipe my phone, but then what happens is behind the scenes, I sell a small fraction of my stock holdings, the money is instantly transferred via Swish or something and I pay for the coffee. So I basically had zero cash and I do like instant selling of investments to just buy a coffee. But that's not, not unrealistic in a couple of years. So closing thoughts. Um, this is a lot, like what we're saying is there's opportunities, it's complex, it's messy. So what I would like, and I think most people would like is just the button in your app, optimize my finances. Like just take care of this stuff. Have an AI, we'll keep you invested above 100%. We'll place you in a good mix of stocks, funds, and crypto that's suitable to your preferences and your life situation. Whenever you make an online purchase, we'll pick the best method that maximizes your cashbacks or deferrals of payments, et cetera, to just run this. Of course, this is not fully possible today, but if you think about what you really want to solve this, it's a lot of automation. Why should people spend like half an hour a day managing their cash or just ignoring it and then taking a suboptimal result? So my takeaways, um, of this, like the trends, it's definitely like investments are getting more cash likes and it's getting easier to move cash back and forth between investing. Costs and minimum sizes are really shrinking. So anybody can invest, everybody should be investing, especially if you're younger. Uh, having a no cash lifestyle, and I really mean not just physical cash, but like no cash at all, is it's a realistic goal uh, where all your money is invested and growing for you, providing you can like take that risk level. Uh, there are a lot of new services, and these services offer real benefits to consumers. Like they're in the market now, everybody should be using them. It's, it's actually a very good thing. But to realize these benefits, uh, our consumers need first the knowledge that they exist and how they work. They also need guidance, and that's maybe a good thing for the panel discussion. There is a difference between knowledge and guidance. And I think automation is going to be key because some of this just requires a lot of daily work and it's simply boring. So it's a good case for APIs, data, automation, and solving people's problems um, automatically. And I'd like to stop there. This is a lot of material. Um, so I'll leave it over to the panel to discuss. And each of these trends is a topic in itself. So if anybody's interested, hit me up on LinkedIn or email, et cetera, to discuss further. It's all good fun. I'll hand back to Sophie there. Thank you.